Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's uh, speaker. Um, I'm actually proud uh, that we were able to um, recruit uh, Kenta Nakamura back in 2016. He had spent most of his time at that, you know, uh, not to be named uh, city and program on the East Coast, but we were able to recruit him out here because I think we had a unique intersection of a world-class interventional group who could provide the training he wanted and uh, the ability to pursue um, his dream of being a translational interventionalist. Um, and so after finishing his interventional uh, fellowship in 2017, we set him up for a hybrid uh, uh, additional year where he uh, continued to work with Bill Lombardi, but also began to uh, work down at South Lake Union with mine and Chuck Murray's group around some of the translational uh, projects he's going to talk about this morning. About the same time, um, there was a group um, here at the university uh, who established uh, a heart regeneration program with the idea that we would bring pluripotent stem cell therapies to the clinic. And Kenta has been front and center and a critical member of that team now since uh, 2017. Um, we have, uh, I'm sure as he'll so share with you, we've had our ups and downs as any translational program does as you get it closer to the clinic, but I'm hoping we are at least in the red zone and can see the day where we will have an IND in a couple of years and be able to bring it into the clinic. In the meantime, he has not um, um, sort of uh, been fallow and has been our interventionist that has led a number of our translational uh, clinical research projects, including um, being part of the adenoviral VEGF uh, trial for chronic ischemia. And we were just talking um, are about to start a second gene therapy trial using AAV to um, uh, deliver circa 2A to patients with heart failure. I'm hoping the next time I get to introduce him, I'll be introducing his third translational project, which will be pluripotent cardiac myocytes in heart failure patients. So welcome, Kent. I look forward to the talk. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that introduction and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to take this morning to give an update on the field of cardiac regenerative therapy um, and then finish the talk with an um, overview of the work that we've done in the last three years uh, to get us to that sort of uh, uh, goal line in terms of uh, in tr uh, true uh, cardiac regeneration. I do have a couple of uh, disclosures relevant to the talk. Um, uh, largely for research funding. The crux of the matter of, of cardiac regeneration is that there is limited intrinsic cardiac regeneration in the postnatal mammalian heart. Um, other species can regenerate their heart, and in this example, a neonatal uh, mouse can survive a LAD occlusion and heal itself completely if it happens within the first week of life. Now, obviously that doesn't happen for us. And despite contemporary revascularization with thrombolysis, PCI, cabbage, with really good medical and device therapies, our patients are still left with irreparable, incurable injury to their heart. Um, cardiac regeneration today is still elusive. But I think through a lot of good science, we can uh, identify some of the hallmark features that we need in a real cardiac regenerative therapy. I think first and foremost is that there needs to be likely a repopulation of the lost cardiomyocytes. So you need new cardiomyocytes either delivered directly. It could be de novo cardiomyocytes that are derived from pluripotent stem cells and delivered into the deficient tissue. Um, or it could be reprogramming methods where the existing host is able to re-enter the cell cycle and proliferate endogenous cardiomyocytes. Regardless, you need new cardiomyocytes, I think. Those cardiomyocytes will recruit new connective tissue, associated cells like stromal cells, and you will be able to remuscularize the tissue. In addition to that, you probably need new blood vessels to supply that new tissue. 
And you need to restore the immunological balance within the tissue so that it's reparative and not detrimental to the host. And that gets to the issue of fibrosis. And above all else, you need to maintain electromechanical function. Um, and for that, I think that you need true integration of the new tissue with the host tissue. You need to be fully integrated. Um, uh, I use ischemic heart disease as a, as a model because as an interventionalist, that's foremost uh, sort of in my clinical practice, but this should apply to really any cardiac disease. Um, so non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies, and then obviously congenital disorders. And I think the first indication that we'll have for cardiac cell therapy will likely be in hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Um, cardiac regenerative therapies is a big umbrella that covers a lot of different uh, uh, science, but I think uh, I, and, um, one good way to sort of break it up is sort of through their therapeutic mechanism. So there are gene-based therapies, there are cell-based therapies, and there is something sort of in between where if, if you think that the putative effects of your cell-based therapy is through secreted factors, paracrine effects, that you can isolate those factors and simply use those factors and not bother with the cells altogether. So those are cell-free products. Another way to divide the field is through their delivery. And there's a number of ways to deliver whatever product, whether it's gene, cell, or cell-free. Um, the first of which is just injection intravenous. You can be a little bit more focal to the heart and deliver it into the coronary sinus through retrograde perfusion so that you get more concentrated uh, delivery to the heart. You can deliver it through the coronaries. You can inject it through left ventricular catheters into the endomyocardium for, for uh, directed uh, muscle delivery. And then you can go in surgically and deliver epicardially. Uh, I am certainly biased, but I think uh, intracoronary and transencardial will be sort of the two main routes of delivery. Um, and that's because we have to balance uh, the ease and the safety of the delivery method uh, with the efficacy. And there's usually a trade-off between these modalities. And so I think going forward, as these therapies develop, we'll see these so hopefully transition to intracoronary and transendocardial uh, delivery methods. Um, gene therapy has been really exciting to follow the last few years. It's really exploded. And there's been a huge reboot in gene therapy where you see trials that maybe sputtered out 20 years ago, um, take advantage of some real um, enabling technologies um, so that uh, they're coming back uh, new and improved. And the, the trials are accelerating. The trials are coming back with, first of all, good safety. Um, and most of them are coming back with suggestions of efficacy. Um, so I think we're getting really close in the gene therapy field. Cardiology is still in the top 10 in terms of gene therapy indications, but uh, we are not at the lead yet. Um, the lead tends to be um, for, uh, for other diseases. Um, and there have been eight FDA approved gene therapies for things like spinal muscle atrophy, beta uh, and liver congenital amaurosis. Um, there are 25 trials in late development in phase two, phase three, and there are 150 in phase two. So there's a lot sort of in the pipeline. Um, and I'll briefly touch on some of the ones that are promising in, in our space. Um, some of the targets that have been explored in cardiogenic therapy um, uh, um, are, are electromechanical function. So this would be uh, replacement of deficient factors, things like um, uh, hereditary diseases like uh, Dannon's disease, BAG3 cardiomyopathy, uh, simply use gene therapy to replace what's deficient. Um, there's been a lot of work on modulating calcium handling, specifically circa 2A, which we'll touch on, and then myosin activators. And those, uh, the premise there is that we want to uh, improve the, the failing uh, dysfunctional impaired cardiomyocytes uh, through gene therapy. Uh, there is a uh, concerted effort on angiogenesis, and this is probably the most um, um, uh, simplistic sort of mechanism, which is that if, if you have ischemic tissue, why don't we just regrow um, the blood vessel, the vasculature to restore perfusion? And so that's through growth factors, and we'll touch on that um, briefly. And finally, remuscularization. And as I mentioned, there are two main routes. One is to re-enter the cell cycle so that there is endogenous proliferation of cardiomyocytes or a, uh, a newer interest in actually reprogramming 
um, host cells such as fibroblasts. And so that would be sort of this crazy idea of taking the scar, putting in viral factors that will reprogram that scar into a cardiac fate and restore function by direct reprogramming. Um, other considerations in cardiac gene therapy include the promoter. So once you've identified the target, how do you express that gene of interest? Is it uh, constitutive? Is it inducible? Uh, is it tissue specific? And then a lot of work around the vector. And the two main vectors that we see in our field are adenovirus. Um, advantages are uh, that uh, adenovirus has been studied for decades. Um, there's good safety data. Um, and depending on a gene of interest, they may be beneficial to have transient expression. So adenovirus is generally expressed for a couple of weeks um, and then stop. Conversely, the other vector we see is adenoviral associated virus, AAV, which has very good specificity um, to heart tissue, um, but it is expressed for up to years afterwards. So depending on the gene of interest, that might be beneficial. Um, the first example I want to uh, uh, mention is the modulation of sarcomeric calcium handling. Uh, and this is work pioneered by Roger Hajar for the last 30 years. Um, circa 2A is our sarcoplasmic ATPase that's responsible for pumping calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum during diastole. And so it's seen as a master regulator of cardiomyocyte contractility and relaxation. And it's remarkable how um, involved circa, uh, circa 2A is in cardiomyopathy and across basically every cardiomyopathy we've studied, circa 2A expression or activity is impaired. And so Dr. Jar isolated cardiomyocytes from uh, failing hearts and showed that um, uh, those cardiomyocytes have impaired contraction and diastolic uh, calcium handling. When he took that same cardiomyocyte and transduced circa 2A to increase circa 2A activity, he's able to restore the degree of contractility and reduce diastolic calcium uh, transients uh, like a normal. Uh, 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 functioning heart. That became the basis of a number of clinical trials uh, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and the most conclusive study to date is the CUPID-2 trial where they used AAV1 to transduce circa 2A in patients with um, severe heart failure, um, EF less than 35%, uh, NYH class 2 to 3. Um, and unfortunately, uh, despite sort of promising um, preceding data, they did not show any benefit. So this is their uh, primary endpoint of combined heart failure events, admissions and exacerbations, uh, and there was no benefit uh, in the long term. Uh, there have been a lot of reasons postulated on why this trial failed. And I think the most compelling data um, is when they looked at patients who um, ended up with LVAD heart transplant in the context of that trial and took those explanted tissues and looked at the degree of circa 2A um, expression, the expression was exceedingly low. It was almost undetectable. Um, and when you compare that to the level of expression seen in the preclinical animal models, it's not uh, surprising that they weren't able to see a benefit. And so this has been a, a huge focus of, of how to improve this therapy. There's been a lot of work. Again, there's been a lot of enabling technologies that have developed over the last 20 years. And this trial has been rebooted as Cupid 3, now known as MUSIC, um, to try to uh, get Circa 2A to work in heart failure. Uh, we recently just initiated enrollment in this trial. We have one patient that uh, is in the wings, um, and uh, we're looking forward to participating in this trial. Um, and this will, I think, be the definitive um, uh, answer as to whether Circa 2A has benefit in our heart failure patients. Um, sweeping, uh, switching to another target, which is angiogenesis or triogenesis, um, uh, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor is a potent inducer of um, arteriogenesis um, in the heart. And in this uh, nice uh, example in the pig, where you put a emeroid constrictor to occlude the left circumflex, allow that to, to um, become chronic over a month, when you transduce uh, VEGF in that heart, um, after a month, you're able to see this plexus of new vessels that reconstitutes the circumflex. So there's a potent ability to collateralize or to restore flow in ischemic tissues 
preclinically. Um, um, and so that spurred a number of clinical trials um, using a variety of different vectors, promoters, and targets uh, to try to um, revascularize ischemic tissue. Um, I'll focus on the REVASC trial, which was one of the more promising ones from uh, 15 years ago. Um, the REVASC trial took folks that have uh, refractory angina, the so-called NORDA, no option refractory and disabling angina population who have a demonstrable ischemia objectively by nuclear imaging that are on maximal medical therapy and have no further revascularization options. When they were given um, uh, uh, adenoviral mediated VAGF therapy, uh, they saw a significant increase in their exercise treadmill times. Oops, sorry. And uh, an improvement in their reported angina class. Um, uh, unfortunately, they did have more objective measures of benefit in terms of nuclear imaging PET scans, and those did not show benefit. Um, there has been a reboot in this trial uh, with the exact trial. Um, this uh, therapy now in, uh, um, includes three isoforms of VEGF rather than the single isoform that was used for REVASC. Uh, it's given at a higher dose, um, and we realize PET to a much higher um, uh, degree. We use PET to direct where the injections are done by the surgeon. Um, we, um, uh, with the, the help of the clinical trial student, Kelly Branch and Jennifer, I see in the audience, um, they were really great in getting this started up during the pandemic. Um, and we ended up being the lead enroller in the phase uh, two transition. Um, and now we have the data back. We've submitted an abstract to ESC and we're preparing a manuscript. So I hope to be in a position to report this at our next quarterly meeting, um, but it's, it's encouraging. There was good safety. Um, switching gears uh, now to cell therapy, um, there have been a number of, of trials looking at cell therapy using adult cells. And um, I don't want to belabor that point. My mentor, Chuck Murray, gave a fantastic ground rounds on uh, adult stem cells and uh, how problematic that, that was. Um, and so I encourage you to pull up that ground rounds. Uh, needless to say, adult stem cells uh, do not engraft, they do not persist, and they do not regenerate the heart in at least uh, the way that they were advertised. Uh, any putative effects are likely non-contractile um, and based on uh, mechanisms of, of, of secretory factors, um, exosomes growth factors, things like that, but they don't generally regenerate the heart. Um, our work here has focused on using pluripotent stem cells as a source of genuine cardiomyocytes that are then transplanted into injured hearts to have not only these non-contractile benefits, but also genuine contractile um, function. Those are cell-based therapies. And I mentioned that there's a sort of a, an offshoot trying to do the same by using endogenous uh, um, uh, cells to directly reprogram, say, scar uh, into cardiomyocytes. Um, all of this obviously to try to restore function. Um, this is a story uh, and this would be a pattern that has been developing over decades. And the first, uh, 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 one of the first chapters of cell therapy is autologous skeletal myoblast transplants. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the first patients that uh, Philippe Menache transplanted with autologous skeletal myoblasts. So skeletal myoblasts are progenitor cells in the skeletal muscle. S skeletal muscle has the ability um, to regenerate. And so taking these myoblasts into ischemic uh, tissue appeared, and this is, these are SPECT images, appears to restore uh, perfusion um, in the areas of injection. Um, this was studied in clinical trials, and unfortunately there was no benefit. Um, was a myoblast a transplantation. Um, what was interesting and important to, to recognize is that they had a lot of arrhythmias. And so in the first 10 or so of uh, the patients, excuse me, uh, 10 out of the first 22 patients that were given this therapy experienced VT or sudden cardiac death. In the trial, these patients all had a, um, AICDs. And in that trial, um, uh, there was an increase in early uh, arrhythmic complications. And so that speaks to um, one of the major challenges that we have in intrinsic uh, cardiac remuscularization, which is this inherent arrhythmogenicity. 
um, pluripotent stem cell derived parasites. That's the focus of, uh, of our group here. And this has been pioneered by Chuck Murray over the last 20 years. Uh, this is where we take pluripotent stem cells, um, uh, embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. We differentiate, expand them into a cardiac uh, phenotype. We then uh, prepare that for injection um, uh, uh, endocardially or epicardially um, to remuscularize uh, the heart. There are a number of challenges that we have identified that are both biologic and technical. And I don't wanna go through that list, except to say that um, we identified arrhythmogenicity that I mentioned earlier, and then immunogenicity. These are transplants. The, um, these will be um, uh, allergenic transplants. We identified those as the two sort of main key barriers to clinical translation. And so I wanted to share um, our story in that regard. Um, but this has been a really fun sort of journey. Um, and it started as a med student uh, when I had a chance to work with one of the pioneers in the field of Chena Yamanaka, we derived patient-derived cardiomyocytes from a patient with long QT. Um, and this is, uh, these are her IPS cells that have been differentiated uh, to uh, at least some cardiomyocytes. Uh, at that time, we were using very primitive methods. This is uh, uh, probably yielding less than 10% cardiomyocytes. Um, but uh, this was uh, pretty exciting at the time. Um, and, I, and I remember uh, uh, in Boston bringing these cells over and waking up early before rounds to sort of feed these guys. Uh, we were using these uh, not for cell therapy or anything, but for disease modeling to see if we could model uh, arrhythmic syndromes like long QT uh, in the dish. Field has progressed tremendously from this uh, from this sort of iPhone four uh, era. Now uh, it's not uh, uncommon to see complete um, uh, sort of plates sort of waving in uh, under the microscope, the so-called sort of magic carpet. Uh, they can beat so vigorously that they actually can tear the plastic medium and uh, literally be a magic carpet. Um, and that has been further refined um, so that we have bioreactors now up to three liters that can generate five, 10 billion cardiomyocytes of clinical grade and an, uh, at an economic scale uh, routinely. Um, all of that has led to a seminal paper um, out of uh, a lot of the, the work here. So I wanna call out um, uh, Creighton and Zach who are on this paper in addition to, to Rob and Chuck. Um, and what they were able to do was in an infructed primate heart, it's a little perhaps hard to see, uh, but there are little sutures here where we've uh, transplanted cardiomyocytes into the ischemic um, and infructed heart. And under histology, you can clearly see uh, the engraftment of these cells labeled with uh, uh, GFP shown in green um, in the blue um, collagen scar. And we see remarkable recovery and function. Um, this is able to restore essentially the function uh, of the heart back to its pre-infarct um, EF. Now, not unsurprisingly for cells that, it, that uh, genuinely remuscularize, we see arrhythmic complications. And this has been deprecated in other uh, labs and in other model systems, in other primates and other pigs. We call this arrhythmia engraftment arrhythmia. And uh, for all intents and purposes, it is VT. It's a ventricularly based autonomic arrhythmia. Um, and we learned early on in our pig studies that arrhythm, uh, engraftment arrhythmia uh, can be lethal. And so um, this is a chart of heart rate um, and time um, along with arrhythmia. And for about the first week or so, um, uh, we're okay, but then we'll see the emergence of engraftment arrhythmia, uh, usually uh, some ectopy, some NSVT, which in some animals will progress to VT that degenerates into VF. We've studied this in both primates and pigs, and um, our understanding is that the arrhythmia is driven by automaticity rather than, say, a reentry. Uh, mechanism. Um, so things like defibrillation have not been generally successful. Um, but with automaticity, we thought there was an opportunity to change the electrophysiologic properties 
of the graft and the host to prevent arrhythmia. Um, a, a one sort of key insight is that the cardiomyocytes that we grow in the dish that are ready to transplant are, are quite immature. Um, and so um, uh, when you consider sort of the immature cardiomyocyte, that time frame of maturity that happens in vivo um, correlates to the degree of arrhythmogenesis that we see. So if you look at the arrhythmia burden back here, generally arrhythmias resolve within the first month of transplant. And so we, we try to leverage that insight and think of a strategy to try to get on top of this in looking at the electrophysiology of these relatively immature cardiomyocytes. We identified a number of channels and a number of drugs to address those channels that are predominantly seen in immature cardiomyocyte. And after serially testing these sort of these agents that we use clinically, we identified avabradine, it's a funny channel inhibitor, and amiodarone, the sticky antiarrhythmic that we all like to use, um, as two uh, 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 drugs that seem to have effect on arrhythmia. And we studied this uh, in, a, in a paper from a couple of years ago where we showed that um, amiodarone with um, adjunctive evabradine therapy is able to control the arrhythmia. It doesn't completely suppress it, but is able to control the arrhythmia. And that has been since duplicated um, in a preprint in another lab in Australia. But most importantly, combination antiarrhythmic therapy um, appears to uh, prevent the fatal complication, the, the degeneration of engraftment arrhythmia into VT and sudden death. And so we thought that this was promising. I will note that we did have a couple of deaths in the treated arm uh, that were due to, we believe, um, immunologic, uh, excuse me, anti, um, immunosuppression related complications. And I'll get to the second point of why we focus on immunoreactivity. Um, and so the other uh, major thrust of the research has been to go further to see if we can't altogether prevent arrhythmia. And this is work done in Chuck Murray's lab with Silvia Marciano to look at sort of what can we modify in the cells that we deliver that will make them um, non-autonomous. So if you think that um, this is an autonomous mechanism of arrhythmia, if these cells no longer beat spontaneously and yet still are functional, wouldn't that be a better cell to transplant? And so we went back uh, to the studies looking at the development or the, uh, rather the, the, the maturation of cardiomyocytes over time. Um, and Sylvia identified a number of, of channels that are, uh, that are either overexpressed in immaturity or underexpressed in immaturity and use those as targets to a really um, a Heraclean effort of gene editing to try to edit these immature cardiomyocytes to at least a more mature electrophysiological phenotype to hopefully prevent arrhythmia. So these are some of the channels that she edited. Um, this is a summary of four to five years of just really, really hard work um, in the so-called Medusa, uh, modifying electrophysiological DNA to understand and suppress arrhythmia study. And um, what we saw was that in knocking out those three channels I mentioned, um, we were able to see a benefit, but not a complete suppression of arrhythmia. And it wasn't until after we knocked out the sodium calcium exchanger um, with this box in pink that we're able to get a, a completely or uh, an essentially quiescent but excitable cardiomyocyte. We went in to transplant those in our large animal models. And this is just um, our controls. These are wild type cells. And what you see is that there's a high burden of arrhythmia. And in this cohort, we saw three out of the, I believe it was seven animals um, had sudden cardiac death or reach early clinical endpoints of unstable arrhythmia or heart failure. When we transplanted these edited cells at a lower dose, we saw essentially no arrhythmias at all, completely electrically quiescent. And that was encouraging. We went ahead and put in a more clinically relevant dose of 500 million cells. And we saw a spike of arrhythmia right around where you'd expect engraftment arrhythmia to initiate, but it self-terminated within a day um, and didn't cause any clinical uh, complications. So we thought this was encouraging. This is uh, 
not quite uh, a uh, aberration of arrhythmia altogether, uh, but certainly a significant difference in the natural history of the arrhythmia that we'd expect otherwise, even at this very high dose. Um, the graphs look good. So this wasn't an issue of engraftment. Um, they had actually very, very robust um, engraftment. We then moved to uh, our primate model. Um, and so now these are um, uh, primates that have been infarcted now um, that are um, also on a, a, base, a baseline of, of amiodarone and beta blocker therapy. So um, a, a little bit more clinically relevant. Um, and when we transplanted uh, these cells, and we have two animals uh, that have gone through the uh, protocol, um, we see the heart rates are controlled. And importantly, we didn't see any arrhythmias at all. Whereas in our wild type control, we see significant arrhythmia consistent with the prior studies. We had good engraftment um, in the scarred myocardium. And so uh, we think that this is a promising um, uh, strategy um, to mitigate the arrhythmic risk. We've done some other studies to look at ablation, um, um, uh, the role of sedation of the autonomic tone. Um, there's work being done on sort of metabolically maturing cells to a more mature phenotype. Um, and so we hope that sort of taking this multifaceted approach will have additive benefits um, and that ultimately will have uh, an armamentarium for us to be able to overcome arrhythmia as we transition into clinical studies. And at this point, I think we're, we're comfortable saying that we've reached uh, a threshold of safety um, that hopefully we can proceed uh, to a clinical trial. Um, the second major issue in cardiac uh, uh, remuscularization is uh, immunotolerance. Um, so these are uh, uh, alle uh, allergenic transplants. So there's going to uh, be some degree of immunosuppression. We know from our clinical practice that immunosuppression is risky. And we see that even in these preclinical studies where two of the deaths, the, the only deaths that we saw in our anti-arrhythmic trial were related to immunosuppression. Now, granted, these were xenografts and they were given high dose of immunosuppression, but still speaks to the danger of immunosuppression and likely would be a major um, uh, drawback to, to any proposed cell therapy. Um, we think that our transplants will require less uh, immunosuppression than what we're used to in terms of orthotopic heart transplant because they're highly enriched cardiomyocytes. They do not have endothelial antigens. And so we think that there will be some more minimal immunosuppression um, that hopefully is steroid sparing that will be tolerated lifelong um, and um, getting to some putative sort of non-contractile mechanisms will preserve therapeutic benefit. And so this is work uh, done by my wife, Daisy, uh, in Rob's lab, um, looking at immunosuppression regimens. And so we took a allergenic primate model. Um, these were male cardiomyocytes transplanted into male or female um, primates that had, and some had infarcts, some did not have uh, infarcts uh, that were uh, uh, completely MHC class one and two mismatched. And um, uh, somewhat to our surprise, um, I'm sorry, that didn't um, show up uh, correctly, but um, within the first two weeks with no immunosuppression, we see no rejection. And so this was, this was encouraging that there is, again, a difference between pure cardiomyocyte transplantation and orthotopic heart transplant is that there is some degree of immune privilege um, using pure cardiomyocytes. So within two weeks, we see no rejection. At eight weeks, however, we see robust um, cellular rejection. We see a dense infiltrate um, in our graft and um, localization of both uh, T and B cells. We went on to test a number of immunosuppression regimens. Um, on the chart here, you see uh, two of our uh, agents, um, uh, uh, Batasat, which is a co-stimulatory inhibitor, and tacrolimus. Um, and both in monotherapy were unsuccessful to supporting graft um, long-term. When used in combination, however, um, and out to 16 weeks, we didn't see any evidence of immunosuppression. This is without steroids. And we hope that this represents a, um, a, a clinically viable 
um, immunosuppression regimen that we will be able to um, uh, proceed with. Um, we also tested tacrolimus and Celsept um, MMF um, unsuccessfully. So uh, this is something that we're preparing as a managed group and hopefully will be the basis uh, of our clinical trials. Um, sort of in the interim, in the last three years, there have been some, some really interesting headlines um, where uh, other groups um, seem to have uh, performed um, stem cell, uh, cardiac stem cell um, derived cardiomyocyte transplants in patients. Um, first came out of China a couple of years ago, and we have not really heard any news since then. And then just, uh, just recently, um, a group, a collaboration uh, with a group in Japan and Novo Nordisk has uh, uh, received an IND and transplanted their first patients um, at the time of coronary artery bypass surgery. So uh, exciting that the field is progressing and hopefully we'll be in a position to do our own trial um, in the coming year or two. So in summary, um, cardiac regenerative therapies are potentially curative by targeting underlying pathology. Pluripotent stem cell biology and gene engineering are enabling technologies that have really changed the landscape over the last couple of decades. And so when you see a trial come back, uh, rebooted, um, um, hopefully we have a much uh, higher chance of success. Uh, Gene-based cardiac therapies are ahead of cell-based therapies. They're in early cl uh, clinical development. I mentioned the exact trial. We're transitioning to a phase three that will start later this year. And hopefully in a year or two, that will be a clinically viable uh, indication. Um, challenges to gene-based cardiac therapies are the efficiency of gene transfer. Um, as well as Victor immunogenicity. You know, uh, Rob mentioned the circa 2A trial that we're enrolling. The biggest barrier to that trial will be the fact that in excess of 50% of patients will already have neutralizing antibodies to the vector, to the AAV. So that, that obviously is a technical problem that will need to be addressed for this to be widely um, effective. In terms of cell-based cardiac therapies, we're just getting started in terms of clinical development. Major issues are arrhythmogenicity and immunoreactivity. And hopefully I've shared some of the work we've done in that space. Um, and hopefully uh, we will not be that far along uh, behind gene-based uh, therapies. Obviously a lot of people to thank. Um, this is a collaborative group effort across multiple disciplines um, and decades. Um, but I wanna, uh, specifically call out uh, our collaborators in cardiology at the clinical trials office. It allows me to sort of have uh, this sort of really fun um, uh, interface, both clinically um, and in the lab, um, all around cardiac regeneration. So thanks very much for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. Can you show uh, the design of the music from? Yes. Um, so I think you showed like figure 572 and yeah. versus 8 and 30,000. Yeah. And I think you tripled yeah. those. Yes. So is there some thought that somehow by adding more, there's going to be an exponential as opposed to? You would think that it was a linear. Yeah, no. I, um, yeah. The, uh, Even if you correct for the dose, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Um, we asked that of Roger Hajar um, at the investigators meeting. Um, and um, I think first, I think those the samples that we got were for the patients that did the, did the worst, right? And so it's a very small population of the patients that got the therapy overall. Um, and so I think it's a self-selected population. It's just, it, maybe a sampling artifact, but I agree. Um, it's simply increasing the dose isn't enough. And I think in this reboot, in the music trial, there's gonna be a huge emphasis on first um, patient selection. So the first step, even before we even talk about the therapy is we screen them for neutralizing antibodies. And I think, um, you know, we're expecting screen failure rates in excess of 50%, depending on what country and what part of the country you are. Um, so I think we're going to be much more stringent in who we enroll in the trial. They, they did, but for, for whatever reason, their screen failure rates were 10, 20%. And so um, 
and in and at least the phase one in the music, the screen failure rates seem to be higher. So sorry, I don't know the technical differences between, but I think we're becoming much more stringent in who we accept into the trial. But it seems almost um, schizophrenic to me that cell therapy companies are working on hypoimmune cells at the same time they're using the immune system to, you know, treat cancer without the idea that the hypoimmune cells are going to be a dead risk. And I just wonder. Like what is there? Because I know there's been a trial where there have been concerns about it. So what what is the sort of state of things with the you know, again risk of the cells out there? Is there any idea the using immunosuppression or baking cell type of immune evading? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um so I, I, I think, um, the, you know, the hypoimmune sort of platforms, they, they are uh, in investigation. They may be added on to cardiac cell therapy at some point. Um, however, they're, they're, they're quite not there. Hopefully we have data that a more moderate, minimal immunosuppression regimen is acceptable over long-term. And I think the, the risk you're alluding to is the, well, if they're hypoimmune, how would the body be able to reject the cells, for example, if they became tumors? And that was the, an early um, uh, concern out of using pluripotent stem cells is, well, these are pluripotent stem cells, couldn't they form teratomas in the heart? Um, and actually that risk seems, it, it's, it's a real risk, but it seems exceedingly difficult. And um, our collaborators have actually tried to grow uh, teratomas out of our, uh, 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 even just undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells, and it seems exceedingly difficult. So uh, although I think that there, there, there is a risk, it seems like in clinical translation, that risk is, is already uh, pretty low. Um, so getting to your point, I think, you know, uh, the initial uh, therapies will use some degree of minimal immunosuppression. I think we'll have data in other sort of indications about whether hypoimmune is safe or not. Um, obviously, that would be um, 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 the best scenario if we don't have to use any immunosuppression. But I, I, I think that the risk of tumor genicity has never really borne out, at least in sort of late clinical development. Um, and, it, and so there's no signal for that, at least yet. Hey, Dr. Nakamura, yeah. th thank you very much for this um, very interesting talk. I look forward to see how it impacts um, the medicine and cardiology in the future. Um, Rob, uh, Dr. McClellan took one of my questions, but thankfully I have another one. Um, I was wondering, um, are there, um, you know, are there people looking into taking the patient's own cells and reverse engineering it into pluripotent stem cells? which might avert the requirement for immunosuppression. I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Sorry, I got distracted. Oh, oh, wait, I see. So you're thinking about autologous transplant. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, Chinoso. Um, and, I, and I think that is a route that um, certain groups are taking. Um, in, in particular, I think there was an early interest in doing that in Japan, which has a, you know, a pretty homogeneous uh, population. And they were able to develop a library of maybe, um, I think, less than 100 haplotypes of, of pluripotent stem cells that cover the vast majority of the Japanese population. Um, that does not translate well to especially our country. Um, and so right now there are, there are severe technical and economical barriers to doing autologous transplant. Um, and if you take the indication that I shared with you here in subacute myocardial infarction, we have a, a, a one, maybe two week window where we'll need to have the cells ready for delivery. And, and right now differentiation, just even deriving pluripotent stem cells from patients uh, can take weeks. The differentiation takes weeks. And so there are technical barriers to that. 
Sorry, the online people have to wait. We want to promote people oh, coming in. Yeah. So I will ask my question and we'll exhaust the room and then we'll go to online. Um, so that was very interesting. I, I um, Kenta, my question is about, um, is there any price for knocking out the channels in the Medusa project? I mean, it was uh, efficacy, because I, I saw arrhythmia, which is great, that was suppressed. Was there any efficacy issues in terms of, do we still have the same benefit in the ejection fraction? I'm sure the ends are small, but can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're, we don't know an answer to that. Um, so that's a really good question, right? Um, the last edit you're probably alluding to is the sodium calcium exchanger, which, you know, offhand would seem detrimental, right, to cardiac function. It's such a key mediator. Um, um, and uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm at liberty to share right now. I think the, st the study is still in progress, so we'll hopefully have a better answer. I mean, I, I guess it all depends on if there's coupling, right? If there's coupling, then you don't have to worry as much about electrical coupling, right? Yeah. Right. Thank you. We do think that there is coupling. Yes. Hey, Kenta, uh, the, the nice talk. I think it's crazy that people are still squirting viruses down coronaries when we know this doesn't work. Everything goes to the liver. 99.9% .9 ends up in the liver. I mean, like, duh. So why don't we just do intramyocardial delivery? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, no, and I, I agree completely. Um, you know, I think we've demonstrated that endocardial, even epcardial delivery is safe. And we know that the product gets delivered in a focal concentrated fashion. We know that's effective. Um, I think f folks still... Um, uh, are are anchored with the fact that they got it to work in large animals to a very good degree. Even in uh, and there is something when we translate from sheep to pig to human that um, that we lose in terms. And so th they've postulated that it's we don't we're not using the right um, uh, serotype of the virus. It's it's a vector issue that it's not a delivery issue. But I agree. I I, I think eventually these therapies should be once we get you know, devices and techniques that make it safe, which I think we have to deliver these things directly to where they're needed in the muscle. Um, 